Um, I'm Murray Louise Ayres, and I'm lucky enough to be the Director General of the National Library of Australia. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. I thank their elders, past and present, for caring for the land that we are now privileged to call our home. I'm delighted that you've joined us this afternoon to explore a subject that goes to the very heart of the National Library's role to collect, preserve and make accessible the documentary heritage of Australia. Now, an artist's legacy can be big business or no business at all, but it's certainly of big interest. Google the phrase an artist's legacy and you'll be offered some 12 million results to trawl through. These include stories of artists such as Henry Moore or Mark Rothko, information about establishing foundations, the role of wives in preserving and promoting reputations. You'll discover that the legacy extends beyond the works of art themselves. It can involve homes and studios, sheds and storage units. Executors and foundations wrestle over the management of careers that after death can rise or fall on the basis of their decisions. And researchers will pore over collections of personal papers looking for that nugget of information which can secure an artist's reputation for posterity. This afternoon, we are exploring the legacies of two artists, Hans Heysen and his daughter, Nora. The library is privileged to be a custodian of some of their work, but perhaps more significantly given our role of their personal papers, which live down on the second floor and the fourth floor of this building. We're also the custodians of a bequest left by Nora to promote her father's legacy. And that bequest has made a number of activities possible, including today's event. Now, our first speaker this afternoon has championed the reputations of many of Australia's finest artists, including Lloyd Rees, Judy Cassard, James Gleeson, Russell Drysdale and Nora Heysen. And in fact, Lou has also been a very important um, partner in collecting with the library. We were just talking about um, my first introduction to James Gleeson, which was with Lou um, some years before James died. The result was that James's personal papers came to this library. An historian, curator, author, and publisher and advocate, tireless advocate, he is really um, just a standout in the promotion of the work of important but perhaps neglected artists, seeking to bring them to the attention of art critics, curators, and the wider public. Lou is determined to restore Hans Heysen's reputation as one of Australia's great artists, not just a good painter of gum trees and sheep. So please welcome Lou Kleepak. Thank you very much. I've been told to be very brief because I'm very long-winded. So I, I shall, I've condensed my bit and if you don't get what you expect from me, you can ask me a question later on. In the 1980s, I became interested in Hans Heysen, particularly his drawings. I had been a curator at the Art Gallery of South Australia when he was a trustee and I went to his studio with him and so on. But this is a long time after. In the 1980s, I became interested in his drawings. Though he had been a household name for decades, his work was little to be seen on the walls of art galleries, though their collections had great many very fine examples. This neglect prompted me to consider doing a book on, it, on his work to re re redress the situation. In order to to do a book, I arranged a large exhibition of drawings and watercolours for the S.H. Irving Gallery. I did this in order to get to grips with his vision and to see his uh, ev evolution as an artist. While I was uh, doing this exhibition, I went to see Nora Heysen, whom I never met. And when I got to Nora and at her house in Hunters Hill, I discovered that she was far more neglected than Hans Heysen. 
and uh, I won't go much into it because Nat Williams will tell you all about her rediscovery and all that. But one thing that she did when she became much more famous than she had been, she said, Lou, you must promise me to do a book on my father that you were going to do when you were, then you d diverted your attention to my work. So for many years, Hans Heisen's work was very popular with the public, but when younger artists and, and critics began to uh, pr uh, become interested in modernism, they made a target of Hans Heisen in order to stop the public's adulation of the subject matter of trees, the things they didn't like. In Heisen's lifetime, peop in lifetime, people were made to feel ashamed if they liked his work. And when, he, when Heisen died in 1968 at the age of 91, he had already been relegated sideways as someone from the past. In Adelaide, however, Heisen was an institution. Not long, not long before he died, Colin Teeley, a marvelous writer, was commissioned to write Heisen's biography. Teeley stayed at the Cedars, the house at Handoff where Heisen had purchased in 1912 the house and where he lived all his life surrounded by the landscape he loved and the source of his, of his, his inspiration. The book was published in 1968. I had something to do with it. If you look at the book, you find there's an acknowledgement to me. I helped, I found some things for Colin Teeley and he actually uh, acknowledged me in the book. It was a fantastic book. No one writing on Heisen can do without this fantastic book, and I must say, an inspiring volume. And yet, if you consult Colin Teeley's entry on Heisen in the Australian Dictionary of Biography, published in 1983, this is how he assesses him. In spite of his achievement, Heisen's vision was limited. His art tended to remain static to lack variety and experiment. From a 20th century standpoint, he was unsophisticated and unscholarly. This is from a champion. This is uh, the cock crow, if you get my meaning. This gives you a good indication at what level Heisen's reputation had sunk, and it coincided exactly at the same time as my interest in doing something about Heisen in the early 1980s. Heisen was a very prolific painter. There was a, a great demand for his work and he was ready to supply the demand. He had a large family to support, eight children and a property to look after. Not all his works are masterpieces. Some are sometimes less than great. And it is these examples that he has been judged on. These are the works that come up at auction, and as his finest works are in museums and are seldom seen, he has been at a disadvantage. Uh, collectors used to have seven or eight pictures uh, by Heisen, and when the, the father died, he left the pictures to the children, they kept the best ones, and they put the, le the lesser ones on auction. So all the not the very best ones come up, and people kept the the best ones, and so you, people start judging Heisen on the wrong examples. However, I must point out that even the slightest sketch by Heisen is worth looking at because it is always based on some truth. One other factor, I think, had a bearing on Heisen's neglect, his friendship with Lionel Lindsay. They met very early in Heisen's career after which Lindsay became Heisen's champion. It was very good for the shy Heisen. He was incredibly shy. And people thought that a person who's shy is also not intelligent. For, some, for someone like Lindsay to write and tell the world how good an artist he was, especially as Heisen lived in Adelaide and Lindsay was an influential figure in Sydney. But Lindsay was very right-wing and heavily prejudiced against the kind of painting which was being produced in Europe, modernism. 
Lindsay would have none of it, and in 1942 published Adult Art, where he claimed that modern art was a conspiracy by Jewish dealers and collectors. Not a very good time to publish such a book, when Hitler was equally raving against degenerate art and sending Jews to the guest chambers. In my book, I also asked the question about how much did Lindsay really like Heysen? I'm rather pleased that Hans Heysen does not get a mention in Lindsay's autobiography published posthumously. It's, it is incredible. If you look at, the, if you look at my book, uh, Peter Lindsay, who's published the book, says if my father was alive, there are seven or eight people who would love to have been mentioned. And he mentions all these people, but not Heysen. And I'm very pleased that he didn't. Heysen may have been somewhat concerned about the new art of Europe, but I think that he would have been somewhat uncomfortable with Lindsay's very right-wing views. And if you look at my book as well, you'll find that Heysen has some nice things to say about Cezanne, which you wouldn't expect him to say, whereas Lindsay would have killed him for it. One of the problems with getting to grips with Heysen's achievement is that we have for too long looked at his work backwards, looking at the old man knighted, photographed with the queen, and a household name, an artist whose achievement was well behind him. And this is how I came across him way back in the 1960s. He was someone who was once very famous. And even I, uh, though I wrote uh, uh, an obituary in the paper and so on, and uh, respected him, didn't understand him at that particular time. But how and when did he really make his mark? To do this, we need to go back and look at his work from the beginning, because it all happened then and very quickly. The young, talented, fledgling artist had explored the landscape that he would paint for the rest of his life before he left for four years in Europe. Now, this is terribly important. He was talented, and he did a lot of painting of the, of the Adelaide hills and trees and so on, wonderful uh, watercolors, and he knew the subject very well before he went. It's like someone who had a gun and he went to get a couple of cannons and a tank. He came back home fired with enthusiasm and ambition. How quickly he achieved success and what success is amazing. It happened just in 12 months. Back home at the end of 1903, he soon sent, soon sent some works to an exhibition in Sydney. There, hung among 500 works, he was immediately singled out. The trustees of the Sydney Art Gallery, remember, no one ever heard of him before, the trustees of the Art Gallery acquired the coming home for 150 guineas and awarded him the first of what would be nine win prizes. And when Mystic Morn returned to Adelaide and was exhibited, the Adelaide Gallery acquired it for 150 guineas as well. So that in December of 1904, Hans Heysen was able to marry his fiancée, Sally Bartels, within 12 months. In 1913, he painted the magnificent red gold in the newly built studio at the Cedars. And in 1921, after some difficult times, and this you will have to read in my book, he finished two of his greatest paintings, The Three Gums in Ballarat, and Drove into the Light, which is in the Art Gallery of Western Australia. And it was presented there to them in 1922 by a man called Vincent, who was the father of my English lecturer at university. Heysen's large paintings are not a response to a scene discovered by an artist tramping with his easel looking for a subject. They are compositions into which Heysen, like the old master that he had studied in Europe, consolidated his experiences and discoveries of light, volume, space, and air with great regard for the poetry that nature inspired in him. These are the ingredients that make a great Heysen picture. They are painted with mastery and knowledge and give us a vision of landscape that has, not been, that has been compressed like carbon into crystal. 
Eisen may have been shy and quiet, but he was extremely intelligent. Now, I'll, te I'll tell you that, in my view, Eisen was far more intelligent than either Tom Roberts and Streeton put together. And if you consider these great works, you will see that he was able to, he was also very serious and sophisticated. In order to create a composition like Driving into the Light, one needs far more than talent. One needs brains. And I remember that once someone asked Constable, what do you mix your paints with? And he said, brains. Heisen's secret was that he was a great draftsman. Neither Streeton nor Roberts were draftsmen. Draftsmanship is connected to intelligence. Drawing is an intellectual activity. It is basically an abstract in nature and proves an enigma to the man in the street. Drawings never sell as well as works with color. We respond instinctively to color, but for black and white, we need to engage the intellect. Through drawing, Heisen was able to extract the essence of landscape, and this enabled him to create compositions into which he could add element to element and elevate the result into something very special. Through them, he was able to show us an, an Australian landscape without that colonial fear of the unknown that you get in the Heidelberg School paintings. For him, landscape was never the bush. It was always nature. Having created a vision of rural landscape where humans toiled, he traveled into the interior, the Flinders Ranges, where he painted the grandeur of a landscape which had a different dimension to the daily routine of human existence. So much for being static and not changing. As a child, Heisen suffered poverty. He had some very difficult moments during his long career, especially during the First World War, where his allegiance to Australia was questioned. He was even left out of an exhibition because of that, only because he was born in Hamburg. But he had arrived in Australia before the age of, of seven. Lambert came at 15, Tom Roberts came at 14, and so on. In 1917, when he was under great strain, he met Elliot Gruner in Sydney. Gruner, who's a, who became a, a very important painter later on, and won, I think, eight, Heisen won nine win prizes, Gruner won seven. Gruner wrote him a letter after their meeting. He is in a, the letter is in the National Library among Hans Heisen's papers. It should be in a, in a glass case with a... With a, with a light shining onto it. I will let Gruner have the last word on Heisen. After thanking him for a book on Clausen, he says that he regrets that they had not seen more of one another. And then he says, apart from Streeton, who was to me an absolute disappointment, there was no Australian artist that I had looked forward to meeting with so much pleasure as yourself. And I was delighted to find, unlike Streeton, that you were exactly what I had hoped for. That's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lou. I think Hans is blessed to have you championing his career so poetically. And you might like that letter to be in a glass case with the light shining on it, but then you wouldn't be the one who found it. So um, it's exciting to have it in a box too. Um, all of us have, I'm sure, or many of us will have visited the homes or studios of artists from Monet's House and Gardens to Georgia O'Keeffe's home in New Mexico, which I've visited. Artists' homes have become museums, research centres and places of pilgrimage. Closer to home, we can visit Brett Whiteley's studio in Sydney or take a weekend drive to Bundanon to Arthur Boyd's property on the Shoalhaven River. Margaret Olley's Sydney home has of course been recreated in a purpose-built facility at the Tweed Regional Gallery in Mwilumbar. And of course there's Heidi near Melbourne, 
are home to John and Sunday Reed and the many artists of their circle. Now, nestled on a hillside near Handorf in South Australia is the Cedars, and this is the home Hans Hassan lived in from 1912 until his death in 1968. It's the home that Hyson's daughter, Nora, grew up in. Following Hyson's death, his family opened the home and the gardens to the public, providing visitors with an insight into the life and work of both Hans and Nora. The property is also home to some 200 works of art. Now, managing a property like this is a major task. Buildings require restoration and adaptation to safely accommodate visitors. Artworks require conservation. Visitors expect a certain standard of service, bathrooms, cafes, gift shops, and plans need to be put in place to secure the future of the property. The Hans Heysen Heritage Foundation has been working to secure the future of the Cedars, and here in a short film by Scott Hicks, we can find out some more. One of the great joys for me in travelling in Europe is visiting the studios and the houses of artists whose work I've always admired. Not far from Paris is Giverny, where you can go to Monet's house and beautiful garden. All over the country, and in Germany and Austria as well, are places of artistic pilgrimage, the places where artists worked and lived. Sometimes, if you're lucky, still with their tools of trade, still as they left it. We have no such place in Australia, except here. I'm standing in the studio of Sir Hans Heysen, perhaps Australia's greatest landscape painter. Sir Hans built this studio in 1912, and it's as it was, as the artist lived and worked in it for all those years until his death in the 60s. I was lucky enough to meet him in the company of my friend David Dryden, who'd been a student of Hans Heysen's. This is really a time capsule, David, isn't it? It certainly is. It's only 14 years ago. They took down the partition and discovered it exactly as Heysen had left it. Well, these are all be history. I mean, these, I, I don't think any of these today would be uh, available. Uh, but they are exactly as you left them. I mean, <laughs> I'm <amazing. laughs> This turpentine smells vintage to me. <laughs> Look at these colour samples. Now, if this material was in a museum, it would all be arranged and catalogued, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be indeed sanitised. But here we see a great Australian artist, as it were, in his own juice. Exactly. In a museum, you could see paintings and drawings by Hans Heysen, but you wouldn't see his process, would you? Not his tools of trade. He told me some of my watercolour brushes are 50 years old. These were precious to him. That's special, isn't it? We are, in a way, looking in on the creative process of a major figure. The fact that the artist still seems to inhabit his studio makes all the difference to the spiritual intensity of a place. Well, it's here in Hans Heysen's studio and home, just down that little path down the hill. That's where he lived. I hope very, very much that you're going to help us keep this place as it is. <coughs> well, that's the old car, isn't it? That's the original car. Yes, sir. was so important in the history and the heritage of South Australia and Australia that anything that was originally part of his life is still alive. This kitchen is alive still because his spirit step in. This is a place of beauty and great interest. All his things are here, all his materials, his brushes, just as he put them down 
after finishing a little touch to this his last canvas. This is an international campaign to raise funds for the purchase of this major cultural asset, the last surviving record of an important Australian artist, and I commend it to you with much love for the place and for Australian art. I'm wondering whether the red spotted scarf struck a discordant note in that, uh, <laughs> in that lovely landscape. So anyway, it's a wonderful vision and we're delighted that today a member of the Harson family, family is with us. Uh, Chris Harson is a grandson of Hans. His father, David, was the family's oldest son. And uh, Chris, I'm imagining that the Cedars played a fairly important part in your childhood. So please welcome Chris to share with us the story of what we can see as a family home and to tell us more about the vision for the future. Chris. Thank you indeed. Um, the video you've just seen reminds me that um, Barry Humphreys, or David Dryden, took Barry Humphreys to visit my grandfather in 1967, not long before my grandfather died. And um, my mother was looking after grandfather at the, at the time and, and reported that, um, uh, amazed at the, um, how, smart, how smart and quick my grandfather was because as, um, as the, the lovely visit ended, Barry Humphreys turned to my grandfather and said, um, please may I have the name of your tailor because I'd love to have knickerbockers like yours. And um, my grandfather, quick as a flash, replied, I don't think they'd suit you. <laughs> and um, because I'm, I'm sure he imagined that uh, Barry Humphreys would be up on stage in, uh, in knickerbockers uh, portraying my grandfather. So, um, and indeed that, that um, quickness of mind, and, and Lou referred to it too, that um, always amazed me. In his 80s, he was um, as sharp as a tack in, in uh, so many of the discussions and things I was privileged to be a part of around the afternoon tea table. My memory of um, the, the Cedars starts um, when I was very young, um, earliest days, and um, the aromas of the cedars, the cedar trees, the pine needles around spread all over the garden from these majestic old uh, radiata pines that uh, surrounded the house and the, the paddocks nearby. Um, and also, I think the, um, the cedar panelling inside the house and the beeswax that uh, nurtured it um, all, all have a, a special scent. Some of it still remains, but um, uh, I don't think uh, my mother and nor grandmother have been beeswaxing the, the uh, timber quite as lovingly as it was then. So, um, but th those aromas have a, have a special memory. There were pine needles all over the, the garden and um, a, a bit later in my um, uh, age, about nine or ten, I think I, I decided I'd do a good deed one day and rake up the pine needles. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful thing to do and um, when my grandfather came down from the studio to see this he was um, very very disturbed and very critical. The pine needles weren't meant to be raked up so I uh, committed a sin of, the, of some kind there. But um, I remember the, the afternoon teas at the Cedars, they were legendary. Um, the, that, that was the general routine. There were many visitors, many famous visitors. Um, that were entertained there and my grandmother was very much the gatekeeper and uh, kept, um, kept the hours to a minimum and so afternoon tea, late afternoon tea was um, usually uh, acceded to so that it didn't disturb my grandfather from his painting and his studio work. But the afternoon teas, as I said, were legendary. Um, a, a round table with, um, laden with uh, homemade cakes and biscuits and always beautiful coffee. Um, they, they always had, and in fact, uh, still at the Cedars, uh, 
of various uh, very interesting looking inventions for distilling coffee. Some of them look like they could have distilled other things as well, but, um, <laughs> but the, the coffee was always um, a very, very important part of the, the afternoon tea menu. And the, the cakes um, and, and biscuits were also uh, just absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, my grandfather, uh, grandmother was very protective about her recipes, and so not all of them were passed on. But, um, and uh, I remember one tale that um, the American ambassador and his wife were visiting for afternoon tea, and um, they, they loved the coffee kisses, or I can't do the American pronunciation correctly, but um, uh, the ambassador's wife asked for the recipe. So um, my grandmother, uh, some days later, cut a recipe out of the Woman's Weekly and sent it to her. Um, she wasn't going to give away her recipe. But around those, around those afternoon teas were just fabulous discussions. And I, I, um, by the time I was allowed to, to be present at them, um, it was uh, in, my, in my teens, and obviously my grandfather was getting uh, older in his 70, late 70s, 80s. And, uh, but even so, I was just amazed at his awareness of the, the, the social life, the, the um, political life. And um, he, he was, even though he was extremely shy, he could, at, at those afternoon teas he could talk with anyone. And, um, at, at any level, and his, his intellect indeed was just amazing to me. The, it was a special occasion when Nora was visiting from Sydney. Um, I remember uh, when I was about um, three, four, five, I think five it was, um, I had to impatiently sit in her studio, which was still maintained as her studio, even though she'd been living in Sydney for many years, um, sit there for a portrait, as uh, we all did as children, and um, uh, sitting there. But of course, uh, she was so perceptive in her in her line, in her drawing, and um, immediately captured all of our, all of us uh, as children. Um, and there are some beautiful sketches still uh, still showing at the cedars of us as children, my father, and uh, some of my aunts and uncles. The, Nora was, um, um, among the rest of her sisters, there was um, quite a, they, they must have had a, uh, I think um, the best description I could say was a very catty um, young life there together because they, um, they talked quite critically of people and um, made us as children quite terrified of um, what might eventuate and I can remember been the um, victim of one of these sessions too one day when I, I think I was in my late teens and Nora was visiting from Sydney and, and um, breakfast was uh, about to be served with my grandfather and, and um, Nora there um, and so downstairs I came from the, the bedroom upstairs and I thought um, I, I better be respectable for this breakfast with these people uh, there, so I brushed my hair for a change and um, and polished my shoes. I thought that would be the best thing to do. So walked into breakfast and and the first thing Nora said was, "You polished your shoes. That ruins the taste of breakfast." <laughs> so, but uh, in spite of her gruffness, um, which, as I say, we we're all ter terrified of, um, she was such an interesting person to talk to and had so many wonderful uh, uh, stories and again her intellect was amazing she had uh, so much to say I remember visiting her um, when she was married to Robert Robert Black and his portrait is in the portrait gallery near hers um, uh, I think I was on a, uh, on a uh, way back from a trip to New Guinea and stayed there he was a ham radio operator a, a um, uh, a professor at um, University in Medical Tropical Medicine, but um, at night he was a ham radio operator. And uh, one of the rooms at, at Hunters Hill was absolutely chock a block with all these radios and amplifiers and microphones and things, and he'd be on shortwave all over the world. And I was very impressed with this. Um, 
I think I was at that age I was probably more impressed with that than the paint, beautiful paintings hanging around the, room, the walls but um, they, they were a very entertaining couple at that time. The, some of the other memories about um, the cedars in my early days were that um, there were turkeys gobbling around the, the yards, there were um, hens and, and um, horses in the paddocks and cows in the paddocks, so it was very much a farmyard environment around the cedars. Um, Cliff Hill was the, the man who milked the cows and um, helped my grandfather and um, drove him to uh, trustee meetings in Adelaide, for, uh, the, the gallery trustee meetings, because my grandfather never drove, nor neither grandmother nor grandfather ever learnt to drive, so they always had to be driven everywhere. I think probably a very wise thing, we should all do that. But uh, uh, And so off, off they went, um, not in a regal car, but my grandfather had a, a Riley sports car um, with, a, with a hard top, but um, a low slung car and so he climbed into this with Cliff uh, at the wheel drive and it was um, very sporty really for a very old man but uh, look, looked an absolute classic. Quite different from the days when he was driven around in the Model A Ford that you saw in the video and um, I did neglect to mention that of course um, Scott Hicks is a relation by marriage because Kerry Heisen Hicks is, um, is a, is a a relation of ours by marriage. But um, he, he drove um, in this A model Ford, uh, by, driven by various people, and the last few trips were by, with my father. They slept in the, in the caravan up in the Flinders Ranges and uh, for weeks on end. Meanwhile, um, my mother and uh, my siblings all stayed at the Cedars and uh, were looked after there. But um, the the caravan there was um, was a, a, a wonderful thing for us to play in when it was in uh, at President the Cedars, and we often had our lunches and breaks in there as children and enjoyed that. It later became a, a, um, a great asset for the Canaries. They lived there for many years um, after the, the Flinders trips had um, had stopped. But my father um, in the um, 70s got it restored uh, back to original by the very people that built it in the first instance. So that was really rather wonderful. 40 or 50 years later, the same firm uh, renovated it. And um, I, you know, the, my father uh, told us all these stories about the, the trips to the Flinders, how that um, they had shortwave radio and um, the, the breakfast announcer in Adelaide knew they were on the trip and would send them Cheerios in the morning and things like that. But uh, my father was the chief cook and bottle washer and my, while my grandfather uh, drew and painted and sketched. And um, the story goes, and I'm, I'm never quite sure whether who was kidding who in this story, but um, uh, Heisen Hill, which is the centre of um, uh, the, the Bratchen of Orge view of many of his paintings, um, very uh, rock faces and um, my father after breakfast climbed up the back of it and put a cairn on, or built a cairn on the top of it and uh, then climbed back around and um, by lunchtime uh, my, my grandfather uh, said I, that uh, there seems to be something on the top of that hill that I didn't see before. Uh, it's still there too, the cairn. I've been up there um, years ago and, and saw it, but um, I think they had a lot of fun together, including one night when um, they camped in a, made the classic mistake of camping in a riverbed. Um, there, were, there was no rain that night, but there was further upstream, and um, uh, a couple of feet of water carried all the pots and pans and a lot of th their provisions away. But uh, they were great times together. The early times at the Cedars also showed me some of the life that existed around Handorf, the Adelaide Hills, the German community there. Um, everything was always delivered to the door. Crum, the, the, um, the local greengrocer, would come with his van, ask what, what was needed and produce cabbages and cauliflowers and lettuces and all sorts of lovely fresh vegetables straight from the van delivered to the kitchen. 
Um, so there's no such thing as going out for supermarket shopping or anything like that, just not necessary. People would um, deliver and each of them were great characters, great friends and, um, and certainly treasured the opportunity to um, talk with my grandparents. The, the thing I, I remember about my, my grandmother um, is um, that her after lunch sleep was always very important and we had to creep around the house during that time. Um, and when it came to afternoon tea or lunch, um, she had the ability to shout cooey, which uh, resonated through the whole of the Onkaparinga Valley, I'm sure, um, to uh, summon my grandfather from wherever he was out sketching or even in the studio. So this um, cooey was just uh, amazing. Very Australian, of course, but uh, never mind. Um, and uh, although they both had s such a strong German heritage, grandfather and grandmother, uh, because of um, the, the situation in, during the two wars where Handorf, for instance, changed its name to Ambleside in the First World War, back to Handorf in between, back to Ambleside in the Second World War and back to Handorf afterwards, which um, was all um, uh, perhaps not important but an indication of um, the attitudes of people and, uh, and uh, just recently came to light that um, some police records which um, indicated that during the Second World War my grandfather was under observation by the police uh, because he had been, um, he was a pacif a very strong pacifist so any anti-war sentiments were always considered to be anti-Australian anti I suppose but um, there, were, were there, there were those difficulties so English was always the language spoken at home, never German, even though they were both very fluent in German and French, etc. But um, my great-grandmother, um, I remember uh, only just, she lived to 100 or 101, and um, she, as um, Lou indicated, um, came when Hans was very small um, in, in 1883, and um, so she never spoke English at all and um, I remember her speaking German um, and her one of one of Hans's sisters Martha had um, I think had, had polio and uh, couldn't walk properly so she was always pushing a chair around the, the wooden floors which I, I distinctly remember even though I'm only th was only three or four at the time but um, so she never spoke any English and um, I, I don't um, know if you, you realise, but uh, Colin Teeley, who wrote that uh, wonderful biography of my grandfather, um, at the age of nine, he, he um, started to learn English because he'd lived in an entirely German community in the Barossa, Barossa Valley, and uh, where the, the schools there were still teaching in German. So um, there was definitely a, there was a lot of German uh, culture surrounding um, my grandparents and the Cedars. I remember clearly the Christmas times there, always celebrated on the 24th, Christmas Eve, um, and the routine was that um, as children we weren't allowed near the studio on uh, Christmas Eve. Meanwhile my grandfather and, and father would be fetching a, um, a wild cherry tree uh, from, from out in the paddock somewhere and put up the Christmas tree and decorate it and I, uh, I, I think uh, the horror of it now because it was all decorated with live candles in a completely wooden lined uh, room with linseed oil and everything floating around in the studio. I, it's a wonder it didn't go up in, in uh, flames completely but um, so uh, Christmas Eve um, we would be summoned at um, six o'clock or thereabouts and it was the tradi tradition with uh, my siblings and my cousins that um, youngest first to eldest Indian file in through the studio door uh, to surround the, the, um, the Christmas tree and the celebrations there. Uh, so very much a German style Christmas was still um, and gingerbread uh, in abundance baked by, uh, by my grandmother. 
So they were wonderful times. Barbara and I tried to, um, my wife and I tried to recreate this um, a couple of years ago. And um, I, I have um, eight children also. Uh, so um, I have also a lot of grandchildren. And so it was, it was time we did something like that. So we went to the Cedars uh, with the idea of recreating such a Christmas and did in fact go through this routine, except for the live candles um, <laughs> in the studio. But um, one, one of the treasures of that, um, that gathering was to hear my children uh, tell me, as they observed their children, my grandchildren, in, uh, in the garden playing and saying, that's just like we used to do. And of course I can relate, that's just like we used to do. So the tradition has carried on. And um, the Cedars, after my grandfather died in 1968, the, the, um, uh, the Cedars was looked after very lovingly by my father. And uh, first of all, by, with my mother, she, she died and then uh, my father remarried uh, uh, to Sue and they carried on renovating and um, maintaining the place and uh, really um, looked after it so well. Um, when my father died, uh, what I regard as prematurely because he got uh, motor neurons disease and died at 75 and he was very fit and would have lived well into his 90s if that hadn't occurred I'm sure. Um, then the, the place was left to me and my two brothers and sister, the four of us. And so we're at a situation where we have um, I think 17 children among us and um, I've already given you a a figure of my lot in there and um, I've already got 13 grandchildren and they've got plenty so it just would become impossible for the family to to um, properly manage the, the Cedars um, as a family unless we narrowed it down again to um, just a, a single person or so. so. So we've established the Hans Heisen Foundation and um, subsequent to when the the video was um, was shot. The, um, uh, I'm very, very happy to say that the federal government, the state government, and the local council, Mount Barker Council, have all contributed substantially to funds to purchase the cedars. Um, there's, so that has been, that, that has actually taken place and it's now owned by the foundation. However, the, the next step in the development of the cedars and the preservation of the cedars is that um, the, the, there's uh, still further blocks of land, um, paddocks to be, to be purchased. Um, the family has, um, uh, I, I think the, the total of that, um, those contributions by the government authorities is three and a half million. The, the, the family has given about two and a half million towards it all and um, other private donors have um, contributed um, some very generous amounts which has been just wonderful. But um, there is more, a lot more to do. The, the property around needs to be uh, maintained and um, kept as, as part of the whole. I think it's very important that, for instance, on one of the paddocks is a stand of white guns, which is, um, uh, we are told, the, the, the biggest remaining stand of white guns in the Adelaide Hills. So it's um, very important that some of these things are, are maintained. And um, we believe it's going to be very important to provide a uh, an art centre on, on the property, a, a bit away from the house but on the property so that um, a, a good gallery can be set up to show more than, uh, there's not enough space in the house to show all the paintings we'd like to show and, um, and other interpretive f facilities there I think uh, will be very, very important to uh, make sure the, the cedars is maintained. The, the idea of um, that the family have always had of maintaining it is that um, if my grandfather woke up today and walked into the studio, he'd find it very much as he left it. Now, obviously, a few pictures have moved around and things like that, but basically, it's uh, as he as he left it, and it certainly has that feel and look about it. The the Onkaparinga Valley, and in, in uh, which I, which the Cedars overlooks, is such a beautiful, tranquil valley. It is just. Um, it has a peace um, that is just uh, 
absolutely infectious when you go there. Um, and uh, as soon as I drive around the corner on Hyson Road into the Sears, you can feel, feel absorbing this, um, this wonderful tranquility. And I remember um, my grandfather's perception um, just amazing me when uh, everyone knows that he loved nature. Nature was his guiding light. But um, to be so observant with it, even at the age of 85 or something, I was out standing out the front of um, the cedars with him looking south and um, a beautiful sunny day. And he said, turned to me and said, um, there's a cool change coming. And there wasn't a tree moving, no, no cloud in the sky. And um, he made that prediction. And sure enough, about an hour later, clouds came over and um, a wind whipped up and uh, the, the, temper the south wind whipped up and uh, the temperature dropped dramatically. I went to him later and said, um, how did you know the weather was going to change? What? And he said, the light became hard. A blue light through the cold air, he could, he could pick up that difference, which I thought was absolutely astounding. And, um, so that, that's how in contact he was with, uh, with nature, the weather, and, uh, and the surroundings. So, so please visit the Cedars. It's um, a wonderful place to, to visit and absorb all this um, history and, and, uh, and my grandfather's um, nature. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for bringing us, I think we've had smell, um, certainly sight, colour, and even the sound of your aunt's chair being pushed around the wooden floors for taking us right back to that place and time this afternoon.